my name is Heather. I'm on the board of Lama Yashi House, and it's it's my great pleasure to welcome everyone and to do a short introduction here of a very long resume of Venerable Yuntin. Um, Venerable Yuntin is an American-born Buddhist nun who's been practicing a uh, practicing Buddhist since 1994 and was ordained in 2003. She spent seven years of intensive study at the Chen Rizig Institute in Australia. She's been a resident teacher at centers in Australia and New Zealand. Um, most recently, she, uh, I guess not most recently, before the pandemic, she spent uh, a good deal of her time divided between touring as a teacher and retreat leader. And uh, she is also on the faculty for a seven year postgraduate program in Israel called the Human Spirit, which is a Buddhist cycle analytic training program. Um, so with that, I will text her right now to, to join us. And, and uh, it, so it sounds like most of you have some background in Buddhism. Is, is that right? Some, you know, maybe a lot of background in Buddhism. Is there anybody who is um, feeling like they're very new? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, maybe a couple of folks pretty new. That's, that's great. Um, and this text is not a beginner's text. Um, it's an advanced text, but I'll do it in such a way that hopefully, even if you're brand new, um, there'll be points that you can access and connect with right away. It's, um, it's a very beautiful text. It's written in a poetic form, and a lot of it makes sense just reading it. You know, it doesn't need a huge amount of commentary. It just needs sitting with. So um, we'll, we'll explore it from a few different angles. And those of you that have studied a little bit more or practiced a little longer, um, please kind of think with a questioning mind of whenever this topic comes up, I have this kind of resistance. Or whenever this topic comes up, I have these points of inspiration. And, um, you know, so kind of listen with a mind that wants to collaborate and, and share with your fellow students um, the best way to practice moving forward or ask about challenges that you might have had. So the first session, I'm mainly going to do presentation and just like background and context and like story time. <laughs> and, um, and then we'll have a little break and a stretch and then we'll do some meditation. Everyone has the root text somewhere in some form. Yes, and I'll put verses up on the screen as well, but it's useful if you have your own copy. All right, so we'll start with refuge in bodhicitta to set our motivation. And if you don't identify as Buddhist, you can just connect with your spiritual refuge in the sense of a concept like compassion and altruism. <laughs> Dagi chun yen ki pe sonam ki Drola penche sangge rupa sho Sangge churam sogi chunam la Jan chu badu dane gap suji Dagi chun yen ki pe sonam ki Drola penche sangge rupa sho Sangge churam sogi chunam la Janju Badu Dane Gabsuji Dagi Jun Yangi Peso Namki Rola Penji Sange Drupasho And just let the meaning connect and resonate. So we're doing 37 practices of a bodhisattva by Geltze Togne Zongpo. And this is in the mind training, thought transformation, Lojong tradition of Tibetan Buddhism. And texts of this type are easily misunderstood because on one hand, they sound like good common sense. And on the other hand, they can sound like a kind of radical reframing you might have come across in, I don't know, some pop psychology positive thinking or, you know, prosperity gospel evangelical Christians, something or other. Or, you know, there's a lot of different um, 
things that can connote, which might be fine things in their own right, who's to say, but that's not what we're talking about here. So it's easy to kind of, in a way, take them too lightly or take them as something that you should already be able to do just because you understand them intellectually. Um, and so the fact that the verses are straightforward and easily enough understood, at least the most of them, it, it can make it sound deceptively simple. And so I really challenge all of us to listen to these verses with an ear that says, yes, but what about on a bad day? <laughs> you know, on a good day, you're like, sure, sure, all sentient beings, all sentient beings, yay, you know. And then on a bad day, you're like, yeah, no, just me, sorry. <laughs> me first. I'll deal with you a lot later when I feel comfortable and rested and my blood sugar is better and it's not so foggy, then I'll deal with you a lot. And these verses are really talking about how to confront the illusion of um, their self-grasping and their self-cherishing. And they're both kind of hardwired drives in our mental continuum, which on one hand give, an, uh, give us an illusion of separateness, and on the other hand, make us feel like because of that separateness, we definitely need to defend ourselves and say, me first, me first. Um, or the I is at the center of the universe, even if it's a painful self-loathing place of depression, it's still very centralized inward. And when you're thinking in a self-cherishing way, which of course comes from self-grasping, this negative self-cherishing is very self-conscious without being self-aware. Can you sort of feel the distinction just in your daily life and the people you know, right? So self-conscious is, you know, hyper aware of yourself, but very much in relation to how do I appear to others? Um, how do I measure up to others? Am I being misunderstood? Am I being respected? Am I being loved? all very um, self-referential, but kind of in comparison to, whereas self-aware is noticing what you're saying to yourself, what your underlying belief systems are, and checking, are they in accord with reality and logic? And am I considering those around me in the choices that I make? So, you know, my easiest example of when people are very obviously driven by self-cherishing is if you've ever been on a, a public transportation situation at the end of school hours and the public transportation is suddenly flooded with school children and the school children's awareness of their backpack is not great. <laughs> can you can you imagine a bunch of school kids getting on the bus with their backpacks and they're talking to each other and then they swing around abruptly and they whack someone with their backpack? They're not trying to be bad, right? They're not trying to be unkind or self-centered. They're just so self-absorbed that they don't notice the impact that they're having around themselves. So this is like self-cherishing, right? It's not like you're plotting like Mr. Burns on The Simpsons, you know, you're not plotting to be a bad person. It's that you're so self-absorbed that you don't realize the impact your actions have on other people. So it's like indifference to others. And it can become neglect of others, it can become harm of others, but in its kind of casual everyday form, it's just, you don't even notice, you know? And when we're in that headspace, it's the opposite of bodhicitta. It's the opposite of the headspace we want to be in as a Mahayana Buddhist practitioner. And so to kind of challenge it, we have to start with noticing that it's never been in our own self-interest to operate this way. That the more self-absorbed you become, the more alienated you feel, the more disenfranchised you feel, and also the more unbearable you are to be around. And so you feel alienated and people feel alienated from you. And it just kind of compounds and compounds. So you get the very opposite of what self-cherishing wants. It wants to be looked after, it wants to be loved, but by getting in this kind of echo chamber headspace, you kind of cut off all the questions that could nourish you. So these verses that we're gonna talk about this weekend 
are kind of directly pointing to how that way of being has not worked and how any time you've opened your heart and thought more altruistically, not in a martyred way, but in a really logic-based way, that your life and your quality of life have really improved and your radius of positive impact have really expanded. So it's always been in our own best interest to think of others. We have to kind of start there to challenge the habit of self-cherishing first. And then hopefully we can be altruistic for its own sake, regardless of its positive impact on ourselves. But we don't want to jump over the step of really recognizing even just my everyday life is better if I shift the focus off of myself. So there's some challenging concepts and um, so we'll have time to uh, discuss and argue and um, have fun debates about it. But I thought I'd just jump right in now and um, do a little bit of content and then I'll pop back on and you can tell me how it's going so far, okay? Okay, so just some key words. Most of you know these words, but just a bit of review so we're all on the same page. Um, and those of you that are very aware of this, just kind of, you know, take it as review. So bodhicitta is a Sanskrit word and you hear it all the time. And in Tibetan, it's Janchub Kisem, which maybe you hear your Geshis throw out. Um, and what it is, is the mind of enlightenment. Translators will also call it the spirit of enlightenment and the heart of enlightenment. But Sem and Chitta really mean mind. Now, of course, in Buddhism, heart and mind and spirit are often synonymous anyway. Just depends on your translator's preference. So when we say mind, we know that we're not talking about the brain, right? We're talking about something that might use the brain, but is not physical. When we look at bodhicitta, what we're talking about is the main Mahayana motivation, the altruistic mind that seeks enlightenment in order to benefit all sentient beings. It's sometimes called the mind with two aspirations, meaning you want to become enlightened and you want to benefit sentient beings. So there's two kinds, ultimate and conventional, um, and we'll come back to those. But basically, just get your head around bodhicitta is the mentality, bodhicitta is the mind that we want. And then the other word you hear a lot is then a bodhisattva, and that's a person with bodhicitta. Yeah, so you get the distinction, right? A person or a being with uncontrived bodhicitta is a bodhisattva. So for you guys who have studied a bit, you tidy up your thinking and realize this means someone who's on the Mahayana path of accumulation or higher, which is the first of the five pathway awarenesses one realizes in the process of becoming enlightened, which includes uncontrived renunciation of samsara. So for new folks just here, bodhicitta is the mind, bodhisattva is the person. For you scholars, make sure you clarify your awareness and understand a bodhisattva is specifically someone who's achieved the path of accumulation. So we've done these two and now we're coming to the 37 practices of a bodhisattva, the text that we're doing. And these are attitudes to develop in order to develop bodhicitta, become a bodhisattva, and eventually achieve the state of a fully enlightened Buddha. And they're written in verse form by Kadampa master Gelse Togme Zangpo in the 14th century. So this is what we're up to. And the 37 practices are found only in the Mahayana tradition. The other list of 37 you might've heard in Buddhist circles are the 37 aids to awakening or the 37 aspects of enlightenment. That list that has um, kind of groups of four or eight that includes the four foundations of mindfulness and so on. And those are practiced by all three vehicles and are found in both the Pali and Sanskrit sutras. This is a totally different group of 37. So it can be confusing if you are studying a bit and there's 37 of this and 37 of that, what are we talking about? The 37 practices of a bodhisattva are specifically Mahayana practices to achieve bodhicitta. So don't get it kind of confused in your mind. So this is a beautiful presentation of bodhisattva conduct and view and has been a major inspiration for the practice and popularity of mind training literature and is enumerated among the six basic texts of the Kadampas. 
So this is a very popular text. You'll hear many people teaching it. There's a lot of commentaries on it available already in English. Some of them very technical, some of them very modern and accessible. So if it's text that you love, there's a ton of follow-up resources. His Holiness the Dalai Lama teaches on this text a lot. Um, most of those videos are available on Dalai Lama Archive on YouTube. So this is a really popular text, so it's good to get your head around it because it'll keep popping up in Buddhist circles. So this word kadampas is important to kind of suss. So the kadampas, like Gelsai Togme Zongpo, the author, they're scholars, practitioners, and mind training masters not to be confused with the modern day NKT organizations. So there's an organization called the New Kadampa Tradition, and this is not who we're talking about. The New Kadampa Tradition is kind of a um, fundamentalist offshoot of the Gaelic tradition, which is quite, I don't know, unhealthy and cult-like, and I would really recommend avoiding it. But because they have the word Kadampa in their title, you could think, oh, cool, they do all mind training stuff. So anyway, that's a, an important aside. We're not talking about NKT. So um, a Kadampa master or Geshe is a practitioner of the Buddhist tradition that originated in Tibet in the 11th century with the teachings of Lama Atisha. Kadampa Geshes are renowned for their practice of thought transformation. So some of you will know about Lama Atisha who kind of um, clarified the Lamrim tradition for us. So those are the things to just be clear on for context before we get into the text. Uh, bodhicitta, bodhisattva, 37 practices, what's a Kadampa master? So as you look at those, um, does anyone want to clarify or ask, um, or is that all pretty straightforward? Is that, I'm sure a lot of you know that stuff already, but I didn't um, want to skip over it just in case there were new people who might get thrown by the terminology. Now I thought we'd do story time. Oh, great. <laughs> Thanks, Aminta. So we'll do a little um, who is this author story time. And I've compiled bits of his biography um, from a few different authors. And um, I think it's nice to kind of hear a little bit more about this Kadampa master. The text is taught so often, but um, who he really was isn't discussed as often. So anyway, that's my plan here. Okay, so just for what was happening at the time, um, Gelsai Togme Zongpo, he lived at a time when sectarian boundaries that characterized the later development of Buddhism in Tibet had not yet fully been drawn. So an open-minded environment encouraged scholars to travel to various acclaimed monastic centers and pursue their studies in Buddhist philosophy, regardless of the center's philosophical orientation. So it's important to know that, you know, all of this like Geluk, Kagyu, Sakya, et cetera, forms of Buddhism, this was, you know, a, kind of a subsequent splitting of what parts of the path they wanted to emphasize and how they wanted to frame it. And the Buddha, of course, taught many, many different ways to get to the same end acknowledging that people have many different personality types and learning styles and dispositions. So he did in fact teach many different styles to get to the same end. And that was amazing and skillful. The problem is, is that then human beings took those differences and said, there's this right way, but not that right. This is right, but that isn't right. When in fact, what the Buddha was saying is there are many correct ways to the same end. So fortunate for us, this text was written at a time when things were less sectarian than they are now and um, way less sectarian than they were when there was a lot of kind of fights and disputes amongst the different traditions. So it's really nice that this text celebrated and used amongst many different forms of Tibetan Buddhism and uh, no one really has a strong sense of ownership of it. You know, it's not like this is a Galugpa text or this is a Sakya text. It's like, no, it's a, everybody's text. And uh, it was developed with that background mind frame. So he was born in 1295 in central Tibet and Togme Zangpo was orphaned at an early age. His mother died when he was three his father two years later, his grandmother then looked after him. When she died four years later, an uncle took him in. From his uncle, he learned how to read and write. 
which was a rare accomplishment for an ordinary Tibetan in the 14th century. So encouraged by his uncle, he entered monastic life at the age of 14. From these humble beginnings, Togme Zangpo emerged to become a prodigious scholar, a respected abbot, a devoted practitioner, and an icon of compassion. When a young monk in the Kadampa tradition, Togme Zangpo quickly mastered the classical curriculum. By the time he was 19, he was hailed as a second Asanga, his namesake, the great fourth century Indian master. So Togme is Tibetan for Asanga. So this was a huge deal to be given this name Asanga because Asanga, you know, for those of you that are Lamrim scholars, he was hugely important in the Lamrim tradition. And for someone at 19 to already be kind of elevated in this way, he was a very special young man. So life in the Tibetan monastery in the 14th century was far from easy. While monasteries usually provided food and shelter for all other expenses, from basic personal needs to offerings for training and teaching, a monk depended on relatives, patronage, or other performance of rituals and empowerments to like attract offerings. Togme Zangpo had no relatives at this point, and his humble and quiet manner did not attract patrons. He wasn't like charismatic, you know. When he had difficulty making ends meet, he was advised to perform rituals for the villagers or give empowerments. Such a materialistic approach, using spiritual ceremonies for financial gain, was unthinkable to him. Instead, he sat down and wrote a poem to remind himself of the essential practices of his chosen path. That poem came down to us today as 37 Practices of a Bodhisattva. So this is something you see even today, you know, the, the monks and nuns and lay teachers that get the most financial support are usually the ones that are the most charismatic and the most kind of famous in some way or another. Um, maybe they have a fancy Rinpoche name or tag that is um, either genuinely deserved or politically attributed, and it's hard to know the difference. Um, and then there's all these quiet practitioners, you know, up in the hills or, you know, in a little hut in the countryside doing amazing practice, and then they're not getting support for their practice. And so this is something that's always happened and is, of course, human nature, you know, you support the people you see in front of you. But I think it's really beautiful to see that his answer to this was not, oh, I'll go do empowerments and big, shiny, exotic things to attract attention. Instead, I'm going to go even further into my own path and become even more strong there. And from that place, um, support will just come. And I don't need to go out and be fancy in order to attract it. So it's, it's a really good example for us of, of how we can live whenever we're feeling a little bit of deprivation mentality that instead of why is the world like this or why don't I rise up to meet the world as it is and start doing some kind of performance virtue signaling work in order to attract attention actually I can just go further inward and work on my path that way support will come so then when he was um, 32 so still quite young right he was appointed an abbot of a monastery and nine years later, he refused a subsequent appointment, insisting that a better person could be found. And he retired to a hermitage in Nolchu, Silver River. He devoted himself to practice for the next 20 years. Instances of his compassion became legend in Tibet. Beggars refused to take alms from him because they knew he would give them his last cup of barley flour or the robe off of his back. Soldiers stopped their attacks when he was present, and wolves and sheep played peacefully together in front of him. So this is very sweet and beautiful and kind of folk story sounding. But remember, we do hear stories like this, maybe from the Christian tradition, for St. Francis of Assisi. It was said that there was um, scary predator wolves in the area he lived, and when he came nearer to them, they became more compassionate because of his powerful influence. So um, anyway, Buddhist uh, saints are described in similar ways. And, you know, he went into hermitage, but he didn't stay completely solitary. 
so he was, you know, away in his hermitage doing mostly meditation and preliminary practices and accumulating merit, but um, he didn't leave it at that. He still was engaged with the community. He just didn't want the responsibility of being the abbot. He left that to other people. And so he remained in strict retreat, but every three months until he died, he would emerge and give teachings on mind training and bodhicitta to thousands of people who flocked from all over the country to meet him. Most gave up concern for the affairs of this life. Devoting themselves to the practice of Dharma, they realized the true meaning of emptiness and compassion. He first showed signs of sickness to encourage his disciples to be diligent, to show how sickness can be used on the spiritual path. When someone asked him if there was any way to prolong his life, Togme Zanko said, if my being sick will benefit beings, may I be blessed with sickness. If my dying will benefit beings, may I be blessed with death. If my being well will benefit beings, may I be blessed with recovery. This prayer made to the three jewels. So this really encapsulates the essence of the text that we're about to look at. It's like whether it's happiness or whether it's suffering, it all can be fuel for the path. Tolkme Zongpo in a nutshell. Um, there's some beautiful descriptions of his life in uh, Reflections on Silver River by Ken McLeod, if you like a more kind of modern accessible approach. And then there's a really beautiful description of his life from Dilgo Kensi Rinpoche in Heart of Compassion, if you prefer a more traditional approach. Um, and this, this author, I think, it's really interesting to look at how he lived the traditional kind of monastic life at the time. You know, he, he was put into the monastery quite young. He did his study and he did his practice, mm -hmm. but he really at some point left the structures and went into the contemplative orders mm -hmm. and really deepened and enriched his life that way. And so I think for us as modern people, the model here is it is important to study it is important to get those structures under our belt, even if we're already good, kind people that know that altruism is a good idea. You know, we recycle, we're nice people. You know, it's like being a nice person is not good enough if we've come across the opportunity to engage our spiritual path. And identifying as a good person can be its own trap anyway. You know, and so I think it's, it's really his life story to me really shows that he had already kind of done all of the things a worldly type monk could do. He was already the abbot of a monastery by the time he was in his 30s, you know, so in terms of, you know, working up the corporate ladder of the monastic world, he'd like ticked all the boxes and then was like, never mind, <laughs> you know, to the cave. And, uh, you know, this is how samsara is, is that the top of one thing is the bottom of something else. And you're never going to get there in terms of what the world says you need to have in order to feel fulfilled. You have to go inward to feel fulfilled. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to read this story, but I, I think that it's interesting to explore it from that perspective. Um, wh what did you guys think when you were hearing some of those? Kind of a classic tale um, from a Tibetan Buddhist genre. Um, but, you know, he did have some tragedy early in his life, and they often say people who are bodhisattvas um, make very strong prayers that in every lifetime there's something that kind of breaks their heart again and helps them connect and access compassion in every life. And um, we don't want tragedy, we don't want to invite trauma, we don't want difficulties in our life, but if we're honest, it's often those very things that help create pathways of empathy and affinity with other people that wind up enriching our spiritual path. So um, you'd be hard pressed to find a great bodhisattva or a saint of any kind who didn't have hardship in their past who just kind of was born and was well-loved and well-nourished and everyone loved them and had all the resources they could possibly need and then somehow still was able to connect with the spiritual path without any connection to or awareness of suffering. Um, usually you need something to kind of slap you awake to the harsh realities of life and then it encourages you to go deeper. Um, anyway, thoughts, thoughts? 
that was hi this is heather yeah that really really resonates i think about um it's really just beautiful this idea of let me be sick if that'll be of benefit and and in my own life many years ago i i needed to get sober and it was the um idea of being brought to my literally you know brought to my knees spiritually and and then again you know it, i certainly didn't think oh goody goody i've screwed up yeah. so much but and then again uh last year my husband died and unexpectedly and uh and again it was something that i would have never i i certainly you know when lama zopa talks about you know problems being like ice cream that it did not feel like ice cream to me at all but but you know these many months later i i can feel where uh it has changed me in a way that i i feel emotional but it but that i yeah. that i can find some gratitude for so so that that really hit me when when you read that yeah it, it is that paradox isn't it it's the opposite of what you want and it's the exact thing that you need and you know and then you try and wax poetic and think of Rumi or Leonard Cohen and there's a crack in everything and that's how the light gets in and yay that's great but when you're in it you're just like this is devastating I don't want this you know like how am I going to get through it and if you've gone through something else already there is that corner of your mind that knows you have resilience you know it's almost like the first one is the most shocking and the most difficult when you've had experiences of loss or trauma or you know coming to sobriety or anything of that ilk and you've kind of come out the other side not as if it's all tidy and finished like that but you know <laughs> to the degree to which you've come out the other side then the next thing that slams you you do feel kind of a deep strength of i will get through this this is horrible but i will get through this it's, it's a different kind of confidence isn't it then um when something's a brand new form of pain or grief and you're not sure if you can get through this. Um, if you're bearing witness to someone else's suffering and it's not a suffering that you could imagine or relate to in any way from any angle, that sometimes makes it harder for you to hold the space for them because it's, it's almost unbearable to bear witness to because you don't even know where to start. But, you know, like if you've had a horrible, messy divorce and then it's five, 10 years later and you've kind of licked your wounds and kind of come to some inner resilience, then if your best friend has a horrible, messy divorce, you can companion them. You know, you can sit next to them and hear them vent and rant and cry and throw things. And you're just like, yep, yep, let it out. I know. <laughs> but if you've not borne witness to something like that within yourself, it doesn't have to be the identical scenario, but you know, kind of a similar amount of vivid, unbearable emotion. Then you know, you're kind of like, oh, but look on the bright side, there's more fish in the sea, and you'll say unbearable things that just make them exasperated, <laughs> right? You know, and you'll try and kind of lift them to happiness and reframing and joy a little sooner than they're ready for because you're uncomfortable being with them, you know. So all of these pains, it's, it's tricky because there's nothing really new in samsara and what is samsara except for us as an individual. So we don't need to be chasing trauma, but remembering that every horrible thing and every wonderful thing that happens to sentient beings, we have already experienced some version of. If we can tap into those even without having experienced it in this life, kind of fearlessly go there and kind of imagine what would it be to be here? What would it be to be there? We can't know anyone's specific individual lived experience, but we can kind of tie some more little connections of empathy, which can grow into a real compassion, which is so different to sympathy. You know, the difference between like compassion and sympathy, you can totally wear out being sympathetic and being empathic. You can totally wear out. You can get empathic distress by bearing witness to someone else's suffering. You do not get compassion fatigue. It's a misnomer. It's not true. It's not possible, but only if you know what compassion is. So, you know, of course, be very kind to yourself if you're feeling worn out by, quote, being compassionate. 
but if we can take a step back and ask what is compassion actually. And you remember the good old definition, compassion is the wish for others to be free from suffering. Seems very easy and straightforward, but what, are the, what does that sentence contain? Suffering and freedom. So that means compassion is holding both of those simultaneously. It is aware of the suffering, it's bearing witness to the suffering, while at the same time holding the potential for freedom from suffering. So then you can watch anything and not get depressed by watching it. You can be with anything within yourself and within others because you know that's not the whole story. So what gives us fatigue and exhaustion is either only seeing the suffering without remembering the potentiality of a mind or thinking that we have to fix the immediate suffering in front of us and that it's somehow our job to put the band-aid on everything, you know, and to kind of, um, I don't know, fix the immediate suffering instead of looking at, this is one suffering in a grand scheme of countless sufferings we've had from beginningless time. And if I can offer something that will soothe in this moment, sure, of course I will. But if I can't, I can't, there's too many conditions and I'm not in control of all of them. So why hit my head against the wall trying to fix everything? I never could anyway. So it's a different experience when you're trying to be an aspirational bodhisattva. You definitely are feeling responsibility for all sentient beings without feeling it's your responsibility. You know, it's this weird paradox of absolutely the purpose of my life is to free others from suffering and bring them happiness. But I'm looking long term, I'm looking the great enlightenment. If the person in front of me is having a bad day, I don't have to fix their bad day, you know? And maybe I can't even, and that doesn't mean I'm a failed bodhisattva. You know, so you can feel the distinction, you know, when you're feeling kind of relaxed and chill and there's not people around you distracting you, you know, you can kind of come back to that wisdom that you already know, that it's not your job to fix things. <laughs> but then in the moment when someone is really struggling, you're kind of like, advice, advice, snacks, snacks, I don't know what, what do you need? A blankie? I don't know, you know, and you just kind of throw in things that might work, seeing if something will stick. And then if nothing sticks, you feel like you're I don't know, a disappointment or bad. And that is another symptom of self-cherishing because once again, you've made their suffering about your success. So again and again, we're trying to just like break, make a circuit break. Yeah, of this, this self-cherishing attitude. Yeah, so yeah, what, what other thoughts are coming up for folks? I just wanted to share, this is Catherine, thank you, this is great. Um, I'm reading Joan Halifax's book, I think it's called Standing on the Edge, that we're getting ready to have a book study on. And the first part is about altruism and how when our ego is mixed in, that's what kind of like, um, for better or for worse, sort of like destroys the genuine aspect of that and compassion. And I think um, that's such a challenge to completely try to remove that. And that's where I guess I, I, when you were talking about fixing, I was thinking, oh yes, that's something I think is being helpful, but that's just myself trying to control and have some sort of positive feedback in this, in this situation that isn't necessarily about the other person, even if maybe I think that it is consciously. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good insight. And, um, Roshi Joan is, is great. She really writes great stuff. Um, but I think, it's also trying to make a, a distinction in your mind between what is symptoms relief and what is getting rid of the cause, you know? So we, we might spend our whole life trying to soothe the symptoms of samsara, you know, and soften the edges and make it palatable. And that is a kind and good thing. But if you know that there's more, if you know that actually we could just pull the rug out from under the whole mess, it's gonna be harder, but it's a better way to spend our time. And the hardness of it is actually an enriching kind of hardness because it really feels like you're finishing something. You're not just kind of patching it up and like keeping it going. Um, and so when we're helping other people or we're helping ourselves, that is a good way to frame it, I think is to ask, is this symptoms relief or is this getting rid of the disease? 
you know, um, I, I often think of it as like the kindest, sweetest things that, that people do when they're not really grounded in their path, you know, like if you're really sad and uh, low energy and just kind of ennui, melancholia, something, and they give you delicious chocolate cake. Now it is wonderful to have delicious chocolate cake when you're feeling sad. Of course, it might be dry and tasteless because you're so sad you can't taste anything. But if you're in that kind of like not too bad sad where you can still taste chocolate and it might lift your mood, that's like such a nice thing for them to do, right? But if part of why you're low energy is because you've been low energy and depressed for many weeks at a time and been eating a lot of junk food and that has been reinforcing the fatigue in your physical body, perhaps a nourishing soup would have been a kinder thing, <laughs> you know, and perhaps, you know, a business card of some therapists or, you know, you know, a lot of things could have been a step up from here's chocolate cake, despite the fact that giving chocolate cake was kind and sweet, you know, but if we know better, I think it's, it's useful to elevate the assistance that we give, you know, and not kind of have a laziness that says, well, this will sort of help for a second. So try this. If it makes sense. Um, I think there's a question in the chat. Let's see. It says, can you give an example of what compassion looks like when you see someone suffering, but you know, you can't fix it? What is it that you do? And I think that's the, that's the very word is do, don't do, <laughs> no doing. You know, um, compassion is, is being. And then sometimes from that being, you can do something and sometimes you don't. But it's kind of like anchoring yourself or concentrating yourself in a way of being first that is just, I see your suffering and I see your potential. I want you to have freedom from suffering. This is what I want for you. I'm not pushing you towards it. I'm not taking excessive responsibility for it. I'm just holding the space that absolutely sees you in both your worst and your best. I'm seeing the whole picture, not just the mess. I'm seeing your ability to fix it. I'm holding everything. And that internal space that you're cultivating for yourself has a strong connotation of respect for the other person. You know, whereas if it's just suffering, it can kind of tip into pity. Like, I really don't want you to suffer, but how did you get yourself into that? You know, <laughs> whereas compassion is, I really want you to be free of your suffering. And I have absolute confidence you will ultimately find your way through it. And it might not be in this life. It might not whatever, but I know that you can because you have Buddha nature. So that very respectful place of compassion is empowering for them because they no longer have to prove anything to you. They don't have to prove how much they're suffering by escalating their demonstration of suffering. And they don't have to feel that pride thing of yes, budding whenever you offer a solution. They'll say, yes, but I, that doesn't work. Yes, but that doesn't work. Or I already know that. How dare you tell something like that to me? Don't you know? Or, you know, what, that's what can happen when we're helping someone who's suffering is that they either feel like we don't see their suffering enough and so they escalate or they think we don't see their potential enough. And so they get like affronted, you know, and kind of defensive. So if you're holding this respectful, compassionate space, then you're still and you're calm and whatever you decide to say or don't say is gonna be the most skillful, you know? It's gonna be the most skillful. So often with, you know, these kind of practices, I think we're trying to preemptively, you know, plan it and get really organized. Here's what I'm going to say or do before I see them, rather than here's how I need to be. And, you know, that's actually a better place to organize is how do I need to be to be able to sit with this person's grief or how do I need to be to sit with this person's rage? And so, you know, you find that stillness, maybe you drove to your friend's house and now you're in the car and you realize, oh, I'm a little anxious about seeing them right now. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. And you remember, it's not about what I do or say, it's how I am. So maybe I'll just stay in the car an extra five minutes and get myself into that headspace before I open the door, you know? Because, you know, from that spacious place, you have a lot more creativity as well. Um, 
It's so tricky, yeah, because we want to do what worked before, but what's happening right now is never identical to what happened before. So you think the last time someone was sad like this, they needed a big hug. So you go and give them a big hug and they're like, don't touch me, <laughs> you know? So it's a, we want to not preemptively get ourselves amped to, here, I'll do this, this, and this, you know? 